Hello, good morning. I'm Ashok Kurokade, consultant rhinologist and anteriorscular surgeon from Winchester and uh, University Hospital, Southampton, UK. I welcome colleagues from around the world on behalf of organizing team to the second day of inaugural winter global rhinology and skull base surgery webathon. Global Rhinology Network is a non-profit organization with a mission to foster surgical education in rhinology and skull base surgery. We have successfully hosted annual multi-center live surgical webcast, The Lioness, since 2014 in collaboration with Lion Foundation. Thousands of surgeons from all corners of the world have benefited from it. More than 2,000 surgeons from 110 countries have registered for GRACE 2020. We had hugely informative and engaging 15 sessions on endoscopic sinus surgery presented by eminent rhinologists and skull base surgeons on day one. We'll be having similar sessions today focused on anterior skull base surgery. This event is hosted at the Global Telemedicine Studio of Professor Wilco Grohlmann in Utrecht, the Netherlands. It is supported by Medtronic and Carl Stoss. Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs? Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology. Featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options, with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality. Get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you. I'm just going to, there's a lot of people who are really helped uh, on the background, and especially our uh, team member in our department. And um, we almost set up uh, this like our control room to run the webinar. So that's our control room. And uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Rohit. That's Rohit. That's Ankur. And uh, Dimitri, you. they put in a lot of efforts to get this uh, event through. So over to you, Brad. Hey, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. All right. So I do want to make sure I can share my screen appropriately because uh, the last time apparently you saw the, let me see, display settings. Can you see the full screen now? Yep. All right. Let me, uh, sorry, exit out. Okay. So, so um, I was asked to, thank, thanks, Ashok, and, and I was asked to present on CSF Week and Skull Base Reconstruction this is a favorite area of mine. Um, I'm a kind of a data nerd, so I've accumulated a lot of data over 13 years of doing this. It's always tough to follow Jim Palmer because he was my original mentor um, and a primary mentor in, uh, in a Rhinology Fellowship. But I like to model my career 
uh, after him and, and I'm always asking questions about better ways to do things. Um, I'm a consultant for Cook Medical and uh, Smith and Nephew. You'll see various instances of use of the code later as well as the biodesign dural graph. So I just wanted to declare that ahead of time. So when you talk about uh, different CSF leaks or, or methods where you have to reconstruct in different etiologies, uh, there's really four main ones. Um, spontaneous, which used to be called uh, idiopathic. Um, we really prefer the term uh, spontaneous. Um, traumatic, of course, are, um, are uh, common of uh, MVCs, penetrating injuries. But spontaneous is really the high pressure type leaks. And this is, uh, this is an area of uh, strong research interest of mine. Uh, accumulated a lot of data over the years. And so I'm gonna uh, uh, display some of that with you and ask some questions regarding it. So uh, congenital is uh, uh, more rare, of course, and uh, I'll just touch on that briefly. Uh, we have a short amount of time uh, to discuss a lengthy topic, so try and cover the salient points while um, asking a couple questions along the way. And of course, neoplasm with, um, with uh, skull base reconstruction. I'm probably gonna, not going to touch on this a lot, not just because uh, this has already been uh, covered with a lot of different techniques and um, uh, in the prior lectures. So spontaneous CSF leaks, uh, one of the reasons uh, I live in the southeastern United States, and uh, this is the diet that we see down the United, in, in the southeastern United States. Um, Brad, I don't mean to interrupt, but I don't think your slides are working. Oh, okay. We just see your title slide. Interesting. Let's try it again. Can you see this now? Yes, that's working. Is it moving? Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna switch it and then uh, let me know if it doesn't, you can see that? Yes, it looks delicious. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Southern diet. And so, you know, we make, we may, we're able to make, uh, you know, even vegetables unhealthy with some fried okra right here um, and even frying some Twinkies uh, down here. So this, this, is a, this is a staple of a Southern diet. And what we see, is that uh, Alabama is kind of top in the top five always on uh, obesity in the United States. And if you look at the state of Alabama, where I'm from, in Northern Alabama, we have a, a radius of about 400 miles where uh, it's one of the more obese areas in the entire country. Um, and the reason for that is, is the associations with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is associated with obese middle-aged females. Um, often these uh, individuals get pulsatile tinnitus and headaches. Um, they usually present with visual findings in their 30s, but they, often, they present later uh, with spontaneous leaks. Imaging findings that we know, um, empty cell attenuation of the skull base with thinning of the uh, CTs. Encephal seals are very common. Um, and there's objective evidence for this too, lumbar puncture data and ICP monitoring. Um, the definition of IH is ICP greater than 20 centimeters on opening pressure and non-obese and greater than 25 centimeters with a normal composition of CSF. Um, and you, here you can see an empty cell in a patient with IIH. So um, we know that attenuation is slow. Brad, your, your slides are again not moving. We still see the delicious food. Oh. So uh, you can All almost right. start from the beginning. Sorry about this. Let, let me... You may keep the food. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, maybe I'll just keep this screen since this worked yesterday, if that's okay. Sorry about that. Um, can you see associations with IIH? Yes. Okay, and now I'm gonna move forward. Do you see the, the transition? Yes. yes. Okay, so it's attenuation of the skull base. Okay, so, yes. so this, this study by Alki Saltis basically showed that spontaneous CSF leak patients have thinner skull bases than traumatic leaks. And you can see the, you know, the, the whole anterior cranial fossa here can be very thinned out. Here we've got a very thinned out middle cranial fossa in this patient with bilateral uh, lateral recess leaks. Um, and it show, they showed that basically um, there's a significant uh, thinning in these areas uh, where there's a lot of high pressure erosion. Um, and this is a common uh, event. So spontaneous leaks, they can present with multiple leaks. Here you got a patient with six different areas of uh, encephalocele's uh, and CSF leaks. Is this moving now? Yeah. Can you see this? Okay. And uh, another patient with a large um, uh, frontal ethmoidal encephalocele and two bilateral recess uh, encephalocele's. Um, we, we published on our first five years of a prospective evaluation of this data. And um, uh, this was uh, updated for uh, recently. We've I've accumulated 190 patients. Um, and it, the average age is around 51. 86% uh, are female, 
Obesity is very uh, significant. Our average BMI is 38. Uh, empty cell is present 86%. And, uh, meningo seal or encephalocele is very high and multiple scolbase uh, defects in almost a third. We also know from ICP measurements that opening pressures are around 26 and uh, closed on average around 34. Um, this uh, really illustrates the point. There's a patient in, uh, who was repaired in Michigan in 2003, uh, and here's her prior encephal encephalocele repair. Um, and then here she presents, she presented with three encephalocele on the left side uh, in 2012. And so over nine years, she actually developed uh, three new encephal seals on the opposite side. And here's her original films from 2003. You can see this is where they repaired. And at that time, there was no uh, evidence of encephal seal on the opposing side. And so it just really shows what can happen over time if you don't take care of the pressure. So you really must uh, address the underlying etiology. We use a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach, um, obviously neurosurgery, anesthesia, uh, neuro-ophthalmology looks at uh, uh, the uh, optic nerves, um, neurotology if there's a, a middle ear leak. But a lot of the stuff afterwards, like weight loss clinic, bariatric surgery, sleep physicians to make sure their, their sleep apnea is taken care of, really important. Sleep apnea, um, there's, there's obviously known that ICP increases during non-REM stages one through four, and the highest values are actually observed during REM sleep, uh, and that's really due to the hypoxia they get from obstructive sleep apnea. My preoperative check checklist is symptoms related to IIH, BMI calculation, um, and all these consultations right here. CT and MRI and everybody, if, um, if possible and plausible for an MRI, I like to look for those signs of high pressure. And uh, one of the things is, um, you know, I do use drains and I want to monitor pressures, but I always use fluorescein in these patients. And this really illustrates why. This is a, a patient with an obvious lateral recess leak. She has no evidence of any other leaks. Um, but when we look at the MRI scan, um, again, nothing in the cribriform, but we noticed this encephal seal back here. Um, but during the approach, um, we noticed some fluorescein coming down from the, from the olfactory cleft. And so she was actually leaking in two spots and we would have uh, not recognized this little uh, dilated olfactory fila uh, leaking spinal fluid if we just went back and, and um, did not use the fluorescein. And that would have been embarrassing if we had missed that. So here's um, an example of my operative repair. This is a 52 year old female uh, BMI of 38. Um, and I just want to ask the panelists, um, know we know about high pressure in these, in these situations. Um, and in, in a lateral recess in particular from an approach standpoint, uh, what would be your, your preferred technique in, in operative repair and approach in, these, in this scenario? Hey Brad, I can, I can start and then we can go, go to whoever else, but um, it's, it's nice when there's such a, a large lateral recess because you don't always have to do a trans approach to access something so far lateral if they have a really wide um, space entering in. So first I would just, you know, uh, open the sphenoids and see how much access I can get that way. But if you needed to, uh, to get more room or to get access, so you can always do a trans wood approach to access that very lateral most area there. And then as far as the type of reconstruction, it's very small and a free mucosal graft may be um, all you need um, over that tiny little area. Sometimes if I feel like I really want something more robust, I'll fashion a nasoceptal flap from the opposite side, make sure that the, the anterior tongue of it is very narrow so it's not going to bunch up too much in that little lateral recess and then lay that in there. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Spreckelson, how are you? Yeah, I mean, I basically agree, agree with Zara. Um, uh, uh, of course, uh, it's very tempting to say transterigoidal approach, but in many cases, if you really perform a large uh, sphenoidotomy, you uh, eventually may be uh, able to uh, cope with the uh, defect. And here we only see just one coronal slide. If we uh, scroll through the pictures, you will probably end up seeing uh, that you have more working space. Um, as for the uh, reconstruction, uh, um, it would strongly depend um, on the size of, of the defect and uh, probably a, um, a, a bath plug technique or something similar might work. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, fascia lata in an uh, underlay technique. That's what I prefer uh, for most of the defects. Uh, 
And, uh, and then the most important uh, aspect here is, um, and I yet try to insist on this, uh, is to not try to obliterate the uh, sphenoid sinus because you invariably will end up with a mucosal. We learned that from the neurosurgeons when they were closing defects uh, down there when doing uh, pituitary surgery. And uh, we have seen a lot of uh, mucosils there. Great. And then is Chem on the panel too? Should be. Yes, hello. Right. Uh, actually, I, I'm also in the same line uh, as Zara and, and Manuel. Uh, but I, I would, right from the beginning, try to harvest a, a nasal septal flap and then with its, its uh, sphenoplatine artery, then uh, even if I need to dissect a little bit uh, with the periosteum of the pterygopalatine fossa, then turn the nasal septal flap over there. Uh, I, I would feel for the future in the, in the coming years, much more safer. Uh, I also don't believe in really obliterating the sphenoid sinus, but, uh, but um, I'm almost sure most of the neurosurgeons were not really taking care of the mucosa when they were really doing that. So uh, that's also a, a, an op operative technical problem, I guess. So even if I need to obliterate now in, in instances, uh, then, then I, I really almost drill all the, you know, uh, and try to get all the mucosa, but it's, uh, it's better not to do, Manuel, you're, you're so right. And then finally, is Christos, is Christos on the panel too, right? Or no? Just the three of you? Perhaps, Jim? Jim? <laughs> all right, we'll just stick with the three yeah, of you. <laughs> I actually wasn't sure. Did I suddenly become a member of the panel? No, no, I guess not. I guess not. So. <laughs> I, I, well, don't worry. I'll say something anyway. Yeah, um, of I, I really have switched over on these, and I know I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I got to admit, I just always do a nasal septal flap from the opposite side now. And I open up the sphenoid widely and just lay it over there, and then I don't have to worry about it long term. All right. So this is my, my, my preference is... Um, you know, and I was talking about the high pressure is I want to create a, a very strong bony shelf. And so um, the way that I, I do this is a technique originally described by Bolger with the trans technique. I don't go through uh, sphenopalatine ganglion and I, I don't disrupt the greater palatine nerve. Um, I can work through both the sphenoid and the, and the, uh, and the pterygopalatine fossa without creating any nerve, creating any nerve damage. Um, and just by dividing IMA, and uh, exposing the pterygoid plates, I'll get a portal for which to work. Um, now, now, really, once I've, I've established this, um, my goal here is essentially, again, is that, is that bone. And so, and that's the issue with spontaneous leaks, right? Because the, the bone is always, getting, um, uh, is always getting thinned out. And so I exenterate all the mucosa using a coblator around the recess because I want to create some neoosteogenesis there. We reduce, we reduce the um, encephalocele to its little bony, uh, op or its little small hole. Um, I'll, I'll place a little epidural graft. Um, and then I, I wanna reconstitute the bone with a bone graft. And this was the kind of the point I was making. I try and, I try and really get bony con uh, reconstitution in the skull base. Um, and I'll do a little three layer repair here, just use a little bio design. Again, I'm trying to like I'm I'm trying to get neoosteogenesis here, so I, I don't want to use mucosa. Uh, and then we of course we pack the defect. Um, and this is a and this is a, you know the the recess has shrank down. Um, and what we want to see, and this is the the point of what I was talking about, is we get this heavy neoosteogenesis. We've got complete incorporation of the bone graft, um, and this is going to be very unlikely to ever have a uh, another issue uh, within that area. Uh, now, other areas, that's another issue unless you're taking care of the pressure. Um, and, and so in this technique, we don't have any nerve damage. Um, we're not uh, getting dry eye. We're, getting, we're uh, not take, going through the greater palatine nerve and we're, we're sparing everything. Uh, and it's a, it's a nice uh, technique that I, I still continue to use. My lumbar drain protocol, um, I drain 10 cc's uh, an hour for about 24, 36 hours. We've recently gone to a more expedited protocol because I don't think this is all that important because of our techniques of repair now. 
Um, and so I generally just clamp it at, at 12 a.m. on, on post-op day one, um, this, this, uh, just that night. I measure the pressure six hours later. Um, if it's elevated, which pretty much usually is, um, give Dimox 500 milligrams by mouth and recheck that ICP six hours later as indicated. Um, pull the lumbar drain once they've kind of brought their pressure down. It uh, should be noted methods for lowering ICP, low calorie diet has been shown, um, significant reduction of eight centimeters of water pressure. Um, um, bariatric surgery, of course, is helping get the weight down. These obese middle-aged females. A uh, serial lumbar punctures really isn't a, a preference, uh, but it but is, a, uh, is an option in people who are uh, refractory different um, issues. And permanent CSF diversion, VP shun is really the definitive. Um, acetazolamide, uh, one gram a day was shown in IH patients to result in photographic resolution of papilledema. So we know acetazolamide Zolamide does work for IAH patients. Um, and what we did was did prospective data looking at the reduction in, uh, uh, with 500 milligrams of, of um, acetazolamide. And what we found was uh, a, an average of about 10 centimeters of water pressure um, uh, uh, decrease. Uh, but this is across the board. So like you'll have, uh, I had a patient with an opening pressure of 50, it went down to 15 with acetazolamide, and then some people who don't respond at all. I'd say around 80% of people generally respond, uh, but I, that's why I do these measurements afterwards to determine their, um, how they respond. The current management is uh, long-term Diamox. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about, oh yeah, you know, Diamox for six weeks after surgery. Uh, that makes no sense to me. The, the, the point of, of trying to control the pressure afterwards is not the acute leak. We all have good techniques on how to repair these defects and, and they're highly successful. It's the late recurrences which are really the main problem. And so these are the long-term Diamox tend to do mild elevation ICP. These are general, di general guidelines. Um, I've had, for example, a, a gentleman who was, um, he had a BMI of 40, uh, he responded well to Diamox, but he's, but he's like, no, I, I, really want, I really want a shunt because I don't have to worry about it. And then other people who res don't respond very well and, and, they, uh, and they refuse a shunt, and I'm like, okay, we'll just stay on Diamox and we'll, we'll see how you do, and, but, I, but I just recognize that they're going to be a higher risk. Um, current management sleep physician, weight loss clinic, evaluation of bariatric surgery for BMIs greater than 40. They generally want them on a weight loss management uh, plan for six months uh, prior to any sort of um, uh, gastric sleeve. And then long-term follow-up with endoscopy, CT. I do get uh, yearly CTs, at least uh, generally at first. And then if they've got no changes in their CT, um, we, we will stretch it out. Uh, Neuro-ophthalmology follow-up. Um, just to show uh, this lady I did last year, and she recently um, uh, she dropped about 100 pounds uh, just with uh, diet and management. Um, and so it, it is possible for these patients to really um, uh, take what you say to heart. Uh, it is important to, to um, tell them the risk of recurrence uh, if they don't lose weight. And so th this is a, a good example of that. Um, it's one of my favorite studies we did. This is a 16, we did uh, patients over a year who, were, who presented with um, uh, with spontaneous CSF leaks and we had 16 patients. Sorry, this is a little bit off, but basically in this, sorry, my, let's see. Okay, so basically in the premise of this, uh, there it is, good. The premise of this uh, is to show, you know, the average age of these patients is several decades after patients with IIH. So these are patients with IIH presented with papilledema in their 30s. Um, and the premise behind this is that you have about two decades there where papilledema has not occurred in these patients, they're resistant to it, and they've had thinning over those two decades causing uh, chronic pressure erosion. Um, we see they're similar in, in BMI and female gender, um, and then none of the patients with spontaneous CSF leaks presented with papilledema, which is uh, really important. Um, when we looked at preoperative opening pressures and six hour clamped pressures, this is, very, this is critical because this is a prospective study. We found nearly identical closed pressures in the patients who were, um, who were clamped after surgery uh, as opposed to the opening pressure of the patients with papilledema. So we re this really proved definitively that, that uh, the, the CSF leak becomes an outlet valve for that pressure. And so if you go in and you just you just repair it and you don't do anything about the pressure afterwards, a lot of times they will eventually have issues. So obviously there's gonna be higher risk individuals um, uh, versus lower risk individuals, but, but it will become a problem. Um, and so uh, one of the medical students and research uh, 
rotation did a, a little systemic anal systematic analysis of um, intervention of elevated intracranial pressure. And what looked through the, the literature, we added our, our case series to this, this as well, but, um, and went through this process. But basically when we looked at people who actually managed pressure or did something to look at pressure and then manage it, um, and that could have been different things, right? So some, uh, I know Aldo Stam basically just puts LP shunts in everybody. Um, uh, other people will do a more measured approach and try and identify those people who are at high risk, uh, like us. So ICP intervention group though, um, in this, uh, when looking at the literature, had a 10% increase uh, success rate over two years. Uh, and so this was highly significant. So, so again, just illustrates that point. And then recently uh, we published the international consensus statement on uh, spontaneous CSF rhinorrhea. Uh, and this was headed by <clears throat> uh, Christos. Uh, and basically um, the, just some highlights from this study that uh, HRCT and MRI uh, will, de will demonstrate the defect, indirect signs of IIH, and this is recommended. Um, there's a strong consensus that leaks must be closed as soon as feasible uh, with no role for watchful waiting or for ICP lowering procedures as a substitute. And this was, um, this was as a result of, of a Spencer Payne's study looking at uh, adding Diamox as a, just a potential in, in substitute of surgery. Uh, I, am, I believe that this is a, a higher risk of meningitis if you don't repair these leaks. Um, and, and so it, I, I highly recommend just, we highly recommended um, uh, repairing. Basic principles were the same, uh, but you know, all sorts of different repair techniques. As you just heard, the panelists all had a different method of trying to repair that lateral recess leak, but basic principles apply. And that's removal of mucosa around the de defect. You gotta remove the meningocele and uh, have accurate localization. I've seen it's issues where like a lateral recess leak, for example, someone would try and block off the, the sinus uh, and then they'd end up getting an intracranial abscess or whatever because you're not repairing at the level of defect. It's really important to repair at the level of the defect. Uh, we also strongly rec recommended against uh, outpatient CSF leak repair. Um, these, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's important not to do, be cavalier about this. If anyone was in my lecture yesterday on, on complications, uh, cerebral hematomas can occur after reducing, reducing encephalocele's. Um, and then longstanding ICP without visual symptoms uh, doesn't matter because you can have man management is needed even in the absence of sim symptoms to, present those subs uh, to prevent subsequent CSF leaks. And then uh, consider for ICP assessment. And that was the whole point of this portion of the lecture is, is you know, if IH is confirmed, it really should be managed to help avoid recurrence. Um, now I'd like to ask the panelists uh, kind of what is, their, what, are, what is their method? I know everyone has different types of methods, but what is your method of, of managing ICP after um, these, these uh, leaks, leak repairs? Tara? Yeah, so, um, so I put everyone on Diamox. Uh, I just sort of encourage them. You know, I, I definitely have the whole conversation about the different options beforehand. I've never had anyone, like you mentioned, opt for a shunt before being on Diamox first. Uh, and I do tell them, you know, it can be difficult to tolerate their side effects and things like that. But the, the next option is something like a shunt and, and that usually convinces them to just stick with it. <laughs> um, so I, I definitely put them on that. Uh, I, I actually, um, we, we've just transitioned at Stanford um, to have a more systematic approach to um, a certain amount of time after surgery, um, get going ahead and getting a pressure check just to see where they're at. Um, so that we're not just letting them go for a long time. Like you mentioned, some people don't respond to Diamox. And so it's good to just know that early versus later. We don't have a program, um, this sort of comprehensive program like you described, but we do suggest that people go and visit with uh, bariatric management specialists to discuss bringing down that weight. And so we do refer off for that. And then as far as directly after surgery, the question of whether or not to drain or not drain, um, like you sort of mentioned, I do a kind of tailored approach. If it's something very small, like the, the type of video you just um, sort of showed as an example, I would not put a drain in that patient. I think that although I think their pressure is elevated, I, I think, as you mentioned, our techniques are, are good enough and, and a good strong bolster behind a small defect like that is not going to really make a difference if you drain or not drain. But very large defects, like, you know, you have the whole clivus open or something like that, I think it's much harder to make sure that your bolster is 
um, really um, getting the best effect. And so for those patients, I would place a drain. So I think, um, you know, one of the reasons I actually use the drain not to uh, help with the acute repair, it's to, to kind of diagnose IIH and, and uh, see how they respond to diamox. Uh, Manuel? Uh, well, first of all, uh, in these types of um, uh, CSF leaks, we don't use lumbar drainage at all. Uh, lumbar drainage is only used in um, high flow CSF leaks, and that is not a discussion here. Um, uh, it is important to, do a f to have a follow-up uh, program or schedule for these type of, of patients with a uh, high uh, body mass index and the potential diagnosis of having an increased uh, uh, cranial uh, uh, pressure. Um, and what I regularly do is after reconstruction is uh, because while they're having a CSF leak active, uh, the intracranial pressure cannot be measured well. Uh, and also potential uh, signs uh, um, may not be present while the um, CSF leak is active. So after uh, the leak is closed, then I uh, send the patients uh, to the ophthalmologist and to internal medicine to cope with, uh, with the overweight and to check uh, uh, the eyes to see whether they have uh, indirect signs of intracranial pressure. But I admit that we don't have a full follow-up program with that. And the reason is that we have probably much less uh, increased body mass, uh, body, uh, mass index uh, as you have uh, in Alabama. And we don't have that uh, type of obesity here. We have some, but not that frequent. Healthier diet. Jim? Uh, the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> Mediterranean diet. <laughs> <laughs> Mediterranean. So, so Brad, it's just, I got to just say it. It's just so nice to see that the student now blows the teacher away. So <laughs> thumbs up on that. Um, and I just, and, and like always, when I watch you lecture, I learn something. So lots of things that uh, there's very little I can add to what's been said, except that we now at Penn have interventional radiology put the lumbar drain in. So they do that first thing in the morning while I'm doing another case and then they roll them upstairs. And so now these cases have turned into the equivalent of a sinus surgery for me, which is thumbs up. I can get another case in because of that. I do always give them fluorescein because as you remember, Mr. Costantini, who we were yep, taking Costantini. care of. That's right. <laughs> I, I, there's a patient with Brad that we had a lateral, a lateral recess CSF leak. We went back, took care of it, did a beautiful job, did exactly as Brad suggests with putting the bone in. We cheer, we leave. Two weeks later, this guy shows up and he's leaking again. And we're like, how in the world is he leaking again? And exactly. he's hard to get to the OR the first time. And then we get him back to the OR the second time. And there on the opposite side was a little small leak along the, uh, along the uh, middle turbine attachment. And I was a complete fool to not look for it. Um, Fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice. And I'm sorry, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So everybody gets fluorescein and I look at everything every time after that. And then I've been waiting two days to get my, to clamp my drain and get pressures. Now I'm going to one, Brad, thank you. Um, <laughs> the hospital will call you and thank you for the money saved by sending them home a day early. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, everybody, I, yeah. everybody gets a cetazolamide with me. And yeah. then if they fail that, they get a shunt, except everybody takes it, like Zara said. And I do find the more systematic I am demanding that everybody goes to I, everybody goes to the weight loss clinic. It just, I don't miss anything. It's the one thing I like about the electronic medical record is I had my nurse practitioner build in for everybody that's got a CSF leak. They have check boxes that have to be done every time. Jim? Oh, you're not, don't hear you, Jim. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is really very important to check for additional uh, places that could be leaking in a very short time. So uh, in, in Stockholm, in, during the ERS Congress, we, we reported on that. Uh, in our cohorts, after giving fluorescein, uh, we have found uh, uh, almost uh, more than 35%, almost 40% an attenuation that we can see through the mucosa because that's uh, what the fluorescein is really uh, the biggest advantage. It shouldn't be really leaking at that time. 
uh, but you, you, uh, we have found really, uh, I mean, I, I need to remember that was more than 35%, almost 40% as second attenuation, generally around the, the creep reform uh, area. Uh, so we almost always look with, with, with the blue light filter uh, because then you can really see through the mucosa. Uh, and if we detect that, we go and just uh, make an, an overlay uh, or even um, uh, uh, a second rec uh, reconstruction at, at that point. So, and uh, we also do not uh, routinely uh, put uh, lumbar drains because we, we are able during the surgery to close that. But later on uh, in our team, uh, generally the neurosurgeons are following up uh, because if, they, if the patient is going to need the shunt, they are the ones who are going to put the shunt. Um, so in the, in the highest, I, I do give the, the a diamox, but then uh, just follow up the patients regularly um, um, and, and help being in the team uh, with the so, neurosurgeon. Then. So let me ask the panelists, like, um, so you wouldn't uh, recommend a shunt in someone with uh, six different encephalocele's if you're not going to do a drain, just do diamox? Just curious. I mean, those are high risk patients. Well, uh, Brad, perhaps really being on the other side of the Mediterranean, we, we really don't have that problem that much, as much as you have. You know, uh, perhaps this is, this is the reason. I mean, yeah. olive oil. California and, doesn't you know, have too many either. <laughs> <laughs> it's also on the Mediterranean <laughs> diet. <laughs> Philly has some, and I have no problem putting a, getting, putting a shunt in if, they're, if the pressure's really high. I mean, I think that paper you did is so great because it really shows acetazolamide will get you about 10. You don't know exactly, but it'll get you about 10. And if they're in the 50s and you give them the, the Diamox and it doesn't drop all the way down in the normal range and it only gets you the 10, you probably do need to go ahead and shun them. Yeah. Well, um, uh, obviously lots of ways to skin a cat there, but um, you know, I think the bottom line is uh, thinking about avoiding recurrence in the future is really the key with those patients. Um, I think for the sake of time, we'll skip congenital. They're pretty pretty straightforward. Um, let me go back to, you know, the, the skull-based defect repair and techniques. Um, and, you know, we all have different little areas of, of how to repair things. You know, Jim mentioned he loves doing fascia lata. Uh, I don't like a second incision. I like for time, I'll use a, um, a, a biodesign graft. Um, the support grafts, we talked about bone and spontaneous leaks. Um, does anyone use bone in any other type of leaks or, or use bone at all? So endoscopically harvested uh, vas vascularized pedicle flaps and other vascularized flaps, these are all become kind of like the, the standards. Um, and so and if we look at the evidence, historical leak rate with grass was 33 to 40%, especially high flow leaks, uh, often very large defects with no bony ledges. And then um, you know, these are tumor patients that can have chemo radiation pre or post-op. Uh, and just kind of shows some of the old literature on this. Um, it is important to note, Germani, who is uh, uh, Roy Cassiano's um, protege, 2007 showed alloderm with 30 defects, uh, had a 97% success rate. So uh, it's interesting to note, like if you don't have a flap available, I know that uh, uh, the Italian group and, and Paolo, I think is, is on the call, but uh, they, they use just fascia lata, like a three layer fascia lata, um, don't even put any pacme in, which is um, bold. Uh, but, you know, looking back at the systematic review that Richard Harvey did of the published evidence and basically showed the level 2A evidence that pedicle flaps are better than free grafts. And so um, it, it, if, we, if we look at kind of a standard um, technique, and I'm going I'm to move this along a little bit to get to the reconstruction um, since you all have, for sense sake of time, you know, we got a large defect here after resection. Um, the technique I like is a, a three-layer repair. I do an intradural. Um, again, this is uh, biodesign. It, it's thin, so it, it kind of fit in the edges. Um, I also use a, this is the only other uh, type of leak I'll actually put a lumbar drain in to do some volume replacement and get the air out of the head uh, by putting some saline in. You can see that we've uh, evacuated the air and um, we're going to place that and tuck that into the epidural space. Um, then we put our, our septal flap up. And, um, and what we do is uh, uh, spread it out over the, make sure it's uh, completely over the area. And this, so these are three layer repairs. They do great. 
um, a covering exposed bone with, with uh, mucosal grafts uh, that's been harped on uh, recently. And, uh, and you, so you get a nice pedicle repair that, that skull base. But what about in a situation, and so here, here he is a uh, year post-op and has a nice uh, uh, septal flap repair. Um, what about in a situation like this? This is a 16-year-old female. She had a recurrent skull base myxoma. Um, I originally did her surgery and I did an extradural kind of scraping because it was a benign tumor and I wanted to preserve her sense of smell. Um, and then, um, you know, we, so we, so this thing had splayed her cribiforms out. And so I, I just kind of covered the area of the a previous septal flap, uh, avoiding the, the sensory, the, the, the olfaction. Um, she actually did have a sense of smell, but had a recurrence. And so uh, what scenario for you guys, you know, what, what would you do in this situation? The septal flap's already been burned. She's had a, a big resection. Would you do a pericranial, a endoscopically derived pericranial flap, or would you do just free grafts? I mean, every case is different, but Brad, in my hands, probably fascia lata, a little fat fascia lata, and then free grafts from the floor actually do really well to cover that and then pack it off and they'll do well. Change the story a little bit, make her fat, make it, you know, have her be radiated, then I'll start thinking about tossing a pericranial flap because she's only 16. I want to save my pericranial flap for, well, I've been at Penn for 19 years. Hopefully I'll be at Penn for another 20. I want to save it for <laughs> someday down the road. All right. Mm, Anybody else? I agree. That's I agree. exactly what I would do probably. Yeah. Um, the thing, thing is that uh, the decision making uh, about the type of reconstruction is uh, usually uh, heavily based on the type of CSF. If it's uh, high flows, a CSF leak, then a pedicle flap is uh, mandatory. If it's a low CSF, a low flow CSF leak, we can reconstruct with fascia lata in uh, uh, two or three layers and then as uh, Jim just mentioned, using um, free mucosal flaps from the middle terminate, you usually remove in order to create a, an uh, approach and space, working space, or even from the floor of the nose. Uh, in this particular case, um, I'm not sure whether we will be able to uh, um, keep and preserve the uh, olfactory area. Um, as far as I can see, uh, there is pretty much involved by, by that uh, skull-based myxoma. And as uh, Jim mentioned also, whenever you are expecting to irradiate a patient, and that is the reason why I don't use neither cartilage nor a bone in the reconstruction, um, then you can still use from the lateral wall. Uh, there are still flaps from the natural wall. You, here we would need to check uh, the anatomy of the uh, lateral wall. You can have them from the uh, um, anterior ethmoidal artery uh, and they have been described also by Haddad and co-workers and others. Um, they can be pretty large uh, um, and helpful to reconstruct, uh, to reconstruct skull base um, defects uh, anteriorly. Um, and then we would need to see whether uh, there are alternatives. I mean, you have the pericranial flap, you have the temporalis uh, muscle uh, flap, which in a 16 year old, I would try to avoid, of course, because of the aesthetics uh, from the donor side. But otherwise, it's not easy sometimes to make that decision. This one, um, and, and so uh, we had already said, you know, she was fine with losing her sense of smell because didn't want it to re recur. Um, and so, uh, you know, re removing this area, I'm gonna fast forward again a little bit. Um, so once we've got the, the tumor out, um, so uh, similar to what the Italian group likes to do with fascia lata, I mean, I'll use the, uh, the little small intestine graft and I'll do a, a, a again, an intradural, epidural. I remember when I, I did the, the septal flap, if I don't have that option, I will actually put just a third layer of, um, of, the, of the bio design here in a second. And so I put, I've used this as my septal flap. Now this is a three layer reconstruction. It's not vascularized. And I, I show this case to kind of, you know, discuss what I, what I really kind of refer to as the art of packing. And so um, anything can heal if it's, if it's in place and, um, and it's supported for a period of time. And so I like to leave my, 
my pa supportive packing in for about two weeks. Here's a zero form bolster that, that Jim talked about. Um, and this is my double barrel spacer. And so what I do is I shove these in a sphenoid. They're, they're a poke pack that's cut in half. And so there's four layers across supported by the orbit. That way they can breathe. Um, and this is it at two weeks. And you can see that, uh, you know, this is it at uh, six weeks. And then here it is at, at three months. And you can see it, it does heal up. Um, and it heals up well, uh, but I, one of the things about um, packing, a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, don't put packing in, um, but, but packing is very important to counteract those forces that, that people are uh, doing afterwards with nausea, vomiting, or, or any sort of straining, um, and I really like, uh, I, I normally put spacers in, something I learned from Jim, um, in just regular sinus surgery, and, and patients do really well with it, so I, I think, uh, uh, packing is actually underrated when it comes to supporting this type of repair. Now, for the sake of time, um, I'm just going to skip ahead uh, to one final case, and this is, uh, I do want to talk about accidental frontal sinus trauma. Um, that's something that, uh, that's one of my favorite things to do is, is uh, manage pretty much all frontal sinus trauma endoscopically now. We'll take care of anterior table fractures, we'll take care of posterior table uh, leaks and, and, and whatnot. Um, and it's important from a you know, traditional approach. This is the way that uh, that's particularly been used for anterior table or uh, cranializations and, and posterior table leaks. We manage pretty much posterior table leaks all endoscopically now. Um, uh, this is, uh, we've had 80 patients um, uh, and used 59 draft 2Bs for approaches, 20 draft 3s, and, and one 2A with tree fine early on in our case series. Uh, but if they don't have any incisions on the face, we will do it all endoscopically. Um, Average fra fracture defect was 18.1 uh, by 10.8 uh, uh, millimeters and average length involved in the post tube table was 15. So uh, just to skip ahead to, the, to a case, um, let's see, I'm gonna go with this one. All right, let's go with this one. So this, this patient right here, so um, they've had a significant trauma, they've had a, a craniotomy, uh, they've got, uh, fractured segments out in the posterior table over here. Um, he's leaking out of the left side, um, some issues with the right side as well. Um, what would be your preferred technique to deal with this type of case? Sorry, you said left, CSF on the left? Yep, on the left. Okay, now we, okay. And so notice this is a, a bridge in the gap around the corner, see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite way to handle this would be send it to Alabama. Yeah, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, so like there's lots of approaches to this, right? You could do a craniotomy, you could do, uh, you know, um, a tree fine type approach. People describe oculoplastic type approaches through the lid. Um, uh, and of course, endoscopic approaches. And um, I, any, any comments, what would, what would be your preference? Well, that, that would I'm sorry, Sarah, please, ladies first, please. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say, um, you know, I, I usually would, this, this seems like, I, I can't remember exactly from the coronal, but this seems like a very nice wide open frontal. So that's great that you have a, um, some good room to work with. Um, doing a draft three to access cross court often is enough to get lateral, but if you can't get lateral enough, you could add a trefine to give yourself another port. Um, and especially if you're trying to put some sort of grafting material through, sometimes that's a nice nice way to bring a grafting material if you can't quite reach from the other side. Um, we have been doing more um, uh, transorbital type of things in conjunction uh, to the lateral frontal reset or to the lateral frontal sinus lately. So that's um, probably what my secondary approach would be. And, Finally, you know, you can always, you can always do a bicoronal if you need to get access somewhere. Manuel? Yeah, well, um, I, I, I agree with what Sarah exposed uh, right now. And, and I think uh, the uh, AP diameter of both frontal sinuses look, uh, looks uh, wide enough to uh, at least have an assessment of what's going on. Uh, that, together with the uh, um, with fluorescein, may show you uh, the exact location of the defect. And if you have a draft type um, uh, three, you sometimes can work well around the corner. 
but I admit that working around the corner towards the posterior table of the frontal can be a bit tricky. So I, uh, I probably would admit that a trephination, a larger one, uh, might be an option. Also an upper lid approach uh, through the orbit uh, and from there drill and have a view from below. And that's a very elegant one, avoiding external incisions too. So external vi visible ex uh, incisions on the long term, I mean. Uh, so that would be probably my option. Um, in the sake of time, I'm just going to get to the case. Um, and, I, and I'm honestly putting this here in, in honor of uh, Chem and uh, Paulo Casanovo, who uh, at the Nottingham Frontal Science course in 2015, they showed me um, the orbital transposition approach. Um, and so that's the, oh, now it's not moving. Okay, here it is. Nope. Is it working? Nope. I'm getting the spinning wheel of death here. Um, oh, here, here it is. All right. So, um, so this was, this is, uh, are you seeing the video now? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. And so uh, this has basically become my approach for anything I can't reach just with a draft, you know, either draft three, draft two B with angled scopes. And the, I think, you know, the, the AP diameter is good, but the problem is that shallow superorbital recess. And so um, by removing the superior orbital plate and the bone, you're able to access around those corners um, and access uh, that lateral, re the lateral recess of the and sinus and the superorbital ethmoid. Um, and then it just becomes just cleanup, right? So these are low pressure leaks. You don't need flaps. Um, I do put in some, uh, I used to, in my early experience, use a lot of nasal septal flaps, but um, grafts work fine. And, and a lot of these extended defects, you're not gonna reach with a flap anyway. Um, and so what we do is we clean up around the defect, make sure it's all drilled flush, uh, and then um, make sure we get rid of all the mucosa that could potentially be in the cracks. And I like to use the coblator for that. Um, and what you see here is the is that little bend around the corner. We're going to take that down so that we can access that area with a graft. Um, and here we measure that defect. Um, and uh, again, just overlay biodesign graft uh, works fine. Uh, you can use fasciolata. Any any overlay graft is fine. And as my talk yesterday, traumatic leaks they they heal pretty much putting anything on there. Um, low pressure, non high flow typically, and um, and then we uh, put in the supportive packing. And so uh, this is my, my preference. These are some flaps I place over my exposed bone in my draft three, um, which really helps with uh, long-term patency in these scenarios. Um, and, and so this is him post-op and we can see a nicely contoured um, and healed uh, defect around the corner here and, uh, and with no leakage. And so with that, I'm gonna end the talk. I'm pro probably way over part of the problem with having a panel, I apologize for that. And apologize to Shook, but um, basically I've talked about CSF leak etiology. You know, spontaneous leak is going to be the high uh, pressure, um, and uh, and we talked about those. And then multidisciplinary approach to address those leaks. Uh, supportive packing, the art of packing, I think is really important. Um, and then uh, frontal sinus trauma really represents a new frontier for otolaryngologists. Something that oral surgeons and plastic surgeons can't do because uh, they don't do anything endoscopically. Uh, and it's an area that I think is. Um, uh, right for uh, research and, and, and prog progress to help patients. And that's it. I'll take any questions. Stealth Station ENT, the advanced image guidance system for the full range of navigated ENT procedures. Engineered with you in mind, based on decades of scientific, clinical, and engineering expertise. We're expanding what was previously possible with image-guided surgery. Flexible and elegantly designed, Stealth Station ENT streamlines the workflow so you can maintain focus. The flat, under-the-head emitter allows for an efficient setup. Its design allows for a large EM field. Easily find your patient's exam through a variety of network options, super speed USB or optical disc. The visualization and modeling features give you the perspective you need. Leverage data from multiple sources to create high resolution 3D images. 
view structures and pathology with high fidelity. Registration expertly matches the three-dimensional positioning of the patient with the preoperative images used for navigation. Patient registration combines registration methods and provides numerical and visual accuracy feedback. Leverage the latest technology for advanced surgeries. See more. Do more. The result? You have an image-guided perspective like never before. With Stealth Station ENT, you're at the forefront of ENT surgery. You are Stealth. Oh, just would like to uh, add a comment about fluorescein. We mentioned that fluorescein is very helpful to identify uh, all potential leaks along the skull base, uh, but it, uh, fluorescein is also helpful to confirm that you have produced a watertight reconstruction of the skull base. And that's why I always use fluorescein as well. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. Not from my side. All right. Thanks, Brett. Thank you.